Let all the earth praise God. Sing to the glory of his name. Come and see what God has done. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Blessed be God who has not withdrawn from us his love and his care. Let us worship God. And we're going to sing the song, Lord, I come before your throne of grace. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we come and we sing of your faithfulness. Sometimes we are singing it in joy, Lord, for we know your goodness to us. And other times we are singing it in the midst of the storm. Sometimes through gritted teeth. Sometimes holding on with the tips of our faith. And yet, Lord, your word tells us that you never let us go that your hand holds us even when we find it hard to hold on to you. That all that you have promised in Jesus, you have delivered. And so we come this morning and we worship you. And we come this morning aware, Lord, that we often forget what a privilege it is to come to you, to share with you our hopes and our fears and to hear your promises to us again. And we pray by your Holy Spirit today, as we come, that you would not only forgive us, but you would hold us, and that together we might encourage each other as we grow in you. And so we pray these words as we say together the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial 
and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. It's good to be in church. It's good to be at a morning service like this. But this is not the only way that church can happen. We also have other ways like Messy Church. And I'm going to invite Lorna to come and just say a word about Messy Church. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're really looking forward to our next Messy Church event, which is going to take place on the 26th of March at 3.30. Now, we have had many Messy Churches here in DL St Andrews in the past, and quite a few people have been asking about when our next Messy Church event will be. So we felt that an Easter celebration would be a really good place to start. Now, just a reminder that Messy Church is a different form of church, and it's aimed at families. And as always, all the families here in DL St Andrews are encouraged to come along and share in the fun. But Messy Church is also open to families out with DL St Andrews too. So if you do know anyone that you think would like to come along and join in with Messy Church, then please do encourage them to come on the 26th. It would be really great to see them. We will also be advertising on social media and through our youth organisations as well. Some of the key words associated with Messy Church are creativity, celebration and hospitality, all with a focus on exploring key messages from the Bible. Our Messy Church here in DL St Andrews will take the form of a welcome with teas and coffees and an activity. We will then have a variety of games and crafts and activity to focus on the Easter story. We'll have a celebration and we will share a meal together, um, which is a lovely part of it as well. We are looking for helpers for Messy Church, particularly for the crafts and activities. Now, they will all be planned, they will all be set up, but it would be really great to have people overseeing these activities on the day and really just interacting with our families as they are moving around. If you would like to help with Messy Church, that would be fantastic. Please speak to Leslie Angus, to Hayley Sloan, or to me, and we will be absolutely delighted to welcome you to our Messy Church team for the 26th of March. Thank you. It's Lorna, and I, I would commend that to you. Whatever age or stage you're at, your help will be appreciated in some way by the team, so please do speak to Lorna and the team if you can help that day. We're going to sing a song in a little while, not right now, which is We Are Marching. And uh, any good at marching? Are you? I don't know. Are, are you are any good at marching? I came down the other day for a presbytery meeting that was on in the church hall and the Boys Brigade were having a marching competition in, 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 in the hall next door. Was anyone part of that? Well, one or two were, yeah. I don't know how they did on. I haven't got the results yet, but it, it was, we, we were trying to decide whether the Presbytery meeting might be more fun or the marching more fun. But I think the marching definitely sounded like a lot more fun. So are you good at marching? Attention. I think we need to get some marching going on here. Colin is our BB captain. I'm going to get Colin to come down. Can I get some volunteers? Anyone want to come and do a bit of marching with Colin? Come on out if you want to come and be... In fact, I, we'll get, if, if, if folk don't come out, we're just going to pull you out. And that might include some ex-boys, brigade boys. <laughs> Colin, can you show folk what marching's all about here? Girls are allowed to. Girls okay, too. It's on. not just boys. Girls too. Come on. You might have to pull out some. You coming up, Alyssa? Nathan, I could do with you here as well. Rachel, bring your, bring your wee sister. Go on. Please. The captain's telling you you need to come. <laughs> the captain's calling. <laughs> you come up, Emily? No? You hiding? Okay, look. Okay, well, I've got three people here that have done marching with me before, and we've got three that haven't, and that's great. Okay, so we're going to give this a wee try. Now, Nathan, we did this in junior section, so it's not the company section stuff we do. We'll try some junior section stuff. So, one of the things about marching that we've always said in this company, 
And Luke's grandpa used to say it, Roy Simpson, used to always say that marching is the ultimate team game. Now, the reason it's the ultimate team game is because you can have one... See, with football, you can have a star player. You can have your Messi or your Ronaldo. Or, who's another star football player? Because I don't like football. Mbappe. Mbappe. We, I haven't seen it. Mbappe. Aye, Mbappe. So, um, so there's all these amazing football players, and they'll carry a team, and they're worth millions and millions and millions. But see, when it comes to marching or drill, you can have somebody that's absolutely brilliant at drill. But see, because you're doing it as a team, see, unless you're all doing really, really, really well, you won't work well as a team, and you won't then go and win competitions and things. Whereas with uh, Ronaldo, what was it? No, Messi, Argentina won the World Cup, didn't they? Do you think they would have won the World Cup if Messi hadn't been there? Maybe, maybe not. Whereas with drill, you really need to all be working together. Drill and match all need to be working together. So I'm going to ask if Luke and Ruri can come to the front of the line for me, please. So Luke, you go here. Ruri, right? You come behind Ellie. Hey, girls, over he's come. Hey, just stand in one nice big line. And Nathan, can you go at the back? Keep them all right. Okay, so we'll practice a few things to begin with. So we step forward, we step forward. Because Nathan can't fit in. That's fine. Like, everybody come forward so Nathan can get in. Right, so marching's not just going backwards and forwards and up and down and round about. It's we need to do turns and different things as well. So can everybody stand at attention? So that's heels together, toes slightly apart, thumbs pointing down the seams of your trousers. And a wee fist like that. Make it do that, do it. If you're doing it, do it right. Come on. Right. <laughs> now, what I'm going to say is I'm going to give the command to do it a right turn. When we do that, we all turn and face this way. Okay, so let's give it a try. Right turn. Excellent. Left turn. Fantastic. Oh, that face up now. <laughs> right, now we try a wee salute. So a salute. From here, we go long way up and short way down. Okay. Right, so salute to the front. Salute. One, two, three, four. You use your right hand. We'll try again. Right hand. <laughs> Left hand, that's scouts and brownies and all that stuff. We're doing the proper, <laughs> we're doing the proper real stuff here. So, salute to the front, salute. One, two, three, four. <coughs> Excellent. Right, now what we're going to do here is, now I've primed looking in Ruri, what we're going to do is we're going to go up, out that door, along and down here. Then if we get down here, I'm going to split these into two groups and we're going to march round and come up and come down again. Okay, we good with that? You know what you're doing, boys? Excellent. Okay. D uh, marching team, quick. March! <laughs> left, 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 right, that's that. <laughs> Parents, they will come back. <laughs> Here we go. Wait, there's only five of them, but we left with six. Oh, there, it's fine. <laughs> Wow. Can they have their seats now? They're going to take their seats. I think we could Fantastic. do that. Well done, guys. You know that's uh, that's that's absolutely fantastic. You know what Colin was saying about it, team sport is is really important. We're going to sing shortly. We are marching, but you know what it, it really is saying to us is about that sense as a church of being together as we go forward with where God is, is leading us. Jesus didn't just call individuals. He called a whole community of disciples, and he brought them together. They lived together. They ate together. They learned together, and then they went out, sometimes in pairs, to do mission together. And that is what church should be. There's a verse in the book of Hebrews, we'll be going to read later, that says, don't give up meeting together as some are doing but encourage each other more and more and more because this is a team that we are supposed to be as a church all together. And you know what's happened as these, as, as these brave children were up here showing us how to march? We've all been spectators, haven't we? That's no good. Now, you'll be delighted to know I'm not going to get you all up to the front just now. But here's what I'd like you to do. If you're able, would you stand? It's all right, I'm not going to get you marching. But what I'd like you to do just now is, first of all, right turn. 
There's a few folk on the right, yep. And just look at the folk you see ahead of you. Okay, if you see folk ahead of you. Now do a left turn and a left turn again or an about turn and look the other way and see who's there. Right. And then look behind you. And then you can sit down. What I'd like us to do just now is something very simple. That verse says we should encourage each other more and more, and not just encourage each other and saying, oh, you're wonderful, but encourage each other as we pray for one another. Encourage each other as we share with one another. Encourage each other, as I've seen folk doing this week, as they've shared with one another hard things and hurtful things that are in their lives and, and supported one another. Looked and shared what's happening in the workplace and how hard it can be to be a Christian in a school and looked for support from one another. That's what it means to be God's people together. So what I'd like to do for a moment is thinking about that left turn, right turn. I'd just like to take a moment and ask you to pray. To pray God's blessing on one person who's on your right and one person that's on the left. It doesn't need to be the person right beside you. And if there was nobody because you were facing a wall, just choose somebody, okay? And we're just going to pray for a moment. And I'd like you to keep in your mind two people, you may not even know who the, their name, it doesn't matter, that are here today. Because we're going to, as God's people, just pray God's blessing on each other. Because we are supposed to be working and encouraging and growing together as disciples of Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we come just now and we ask that you would bind us. If we've been hurt by people in church, we ask you would fill us with forgiveness. If you ha we have been let down, we ask that you would encourage us. But we pray just now that you would help us to grow together, support one another and love one another. And each of us brings before you just now, asking your blessing, a person on their left, and a person on the right. We ask that as we sing our songs together in step, so that our conversation after the service as well might be encouraging and building each other up. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're going to sing. We are marching. And now the Sunday school might fall out.
thanks to the choir. Just one or two announcements this morning. Um, one is that the Kirk Session meeting that was due to happen on Thursday has been postponed. And the reason for that is that we have various meetings going on about presbytery planning just now. So we've had to move the session meeting. So it won't be on Thursday, but it'll be um, on Wednesday, the 15th of March in the large hall. So elders and board members, if you can take note of that, I think Helen will send out an email to remind us. A couple of other things. I mentioned last week that I've got two folk who want to join the church, and we're going to be looking at that together. And just if there is anybody else who would like to be part of exploring what it is to be a Christian and, and be part of the church, then please do speak to me as soon as possible. Um, grief share. If, you, if you've got the sheet, by the way, you'll find some of these announcements on it. So please do, do, do look at this because new things do appear. One of the things is we talk about encouraging each other and supporting each other is supporting each other when times are hard or when we're feeling a sense of loss. And sometimes that's recent losses, and sometimes it's losses that are some way back. So a group of folk are going to be exploring how, as a church, um, people might support one another better. And there's an invitation, if, if that's something that interests you, to come along to a meeting a week on Tuesday. And as I say, the details and the times are on the sheet. Um, and we mentioned Messy Church already, so I think that's all the announcements that I have. Let's hear the Word of God now as we read from the book of Hebrews and chapter 10. Let's listen for God's Word. The writer writes this. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, this is Jesus, has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this, for he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up the habit of meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word. We're going to sing again, and we're going to sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. The choir sang this for us last week um, and taught it to us, but they're going to sing the first verse, I think, and then we're going to sing it together.
Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word, written to encourage people so long ago, we pray today that it would be an encouragement to us. We pray today we might hear it, and it might bring us into your presence and your peace, O God, who holds us fast. Amen. Let us worship God. All right. That's bad, isn't it? But you'll remember it. And I want to talk about lettuce a little bit today. Not just because it's expensive right now. There's a shortage of it. But because actually it sums up in many ways what we want to say today as we look at the book of Hebrews. It's interesting that one of the things that you're taught when you when you are, are, are taught to, to lead worship is, is this, that when you start a service, it's important how you do it. You see, any other gathering, you would simply say, good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. The fire doors are there. Please switch off your mobile phones and all the rest of it. And then you would get into the meeting. But actually, when we begin worship, the person that's leading worship is supposed to give what's called a call to worship. And that is supposed to be something that invites the congregation to reflect. We are about to come into the presence of God, and we are able to do that because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Here's how the Church of Scotland's prayer book starts its suggested morning service. Let the earth acclaim God, sing to the glory of His name, come and see what God has done. Let the sound of His praise be heard. Blessed is God who has not withdrawn His love and His care. Let us worship God. You're never going to be here to those words again without thinking of a vegetable, are you? Let us worship God. Now, one of the reasons I want to talk about a lettuce today is because the passage or the part of the passage we're going to look at from Hebrews has three lettuces, lettai, I don't know, lettuces in it, and we'll come on to them shortly. But what this letter has been doing for those that have not necessarily heard all the sermons is, is this. The preacher has been taking a tired, exhausted pe- people, and he has been pointing them to Jesus all the way. He's saying you can keep going with confidence because of Jesus. Jesus isn't just someone we, we sort of know and we, we, we hear stories about. Jesus is the one who is higher than the angels. Jesus is the one who is the heir of all things. Jesus is the one who God has sent. Jesus is fully human. And he understands suffering and weakness and the things that we struggle with. And that relates to so much of the gospel story where we see Jesus struggling as we have struggled, and yet he has overcome. And the last few chapters and the beginning of the chapter we read really saying not only is Jesus the high priest that understands, Jesus is the high priest who has offered himself as the sacrifice. And that shows his love, but it also shows that the way to God, the way to come into God's presence is open to us. And therefore, the passage goes on Now, in verse 10 of this passage, sorry, chapter 10, um, verse 19, rather, it says, therefore. Now, I'm going to give you a little hint when you're reading the Bible. Someone told me a long time ago, see, when you see a therefore, always ask what it's there for. Yeah, bad word, but it's bad puns today. But anyway, the point of that is where you see a therefore, what tends to be happening is the scripture is saying, we told you a whole lot of amazing things about God. Therefore, this is what it means for you in your spiritual life. So when we get a therefore, we tend to get things that we really need to concentrate on because they make a difference to how we respond. And then we get the lettuces. So therefore, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus through a new and living way, through the curtain, his body, we'll come on to this later, and since we have a great high priest, it says, let us draw near to God. 
You see how my pun's going to help you remember this, isn't it? Let us draw near to God. Now, actually, this is one of these things that we can see in a call to worship and we can sort of take for granted. But it's actually a mind-blowing thing. In the Old Testament, the Jewish people regularly came up to Jerusalem. And they came up to the temple that signified God's presence. And as they came up to the temple, they came up with joy. They came up singing psalms of ascent. They came up in, in, in a crowd of festival. And that's where you get Psalm 1, 2, 2. I rejoiced when they said to me, let's go to the house of God. And they drew near to Jerusalem. And they drew near to Mount Zion. And they drew near to the temple. And all that drawing near was important, coming together and drawing close to God. But there was, in the Old Testament, always a limit to drawing near because there was always a wall. When you came to the temple, there was a wall that said, no Gentiles beyond this point. And beyond that, there was another wall that kept the women in their place. Sorry, girls. And beyond that, there was another wall that kept everybody that wasn't a priest in their place. And beyond that, there was a big, thick curtain dividing even the priests from the holiest of the holy places where the Ark of the Covenant was stored. And only one man, the high priest, only once a year, only after he had made sacrifices for all the sins of all the people, was allowed to go in through that curtain into the holiest place. Everybody else was being told, you can draw near, but not too near. Because God is holy and you are sinful. Walls to keep you out. And all of that was saying, that sin, that sense of unworthiness that you have, it's real. Even Moses was not allowed to come right into the presence of God. But then, something happened that changed everything. And we got that in the earlier verse, in verse 19, where it said, we have confidence to enter the holy place by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, since we have a great high priest over the house of God. And what that's referring to is something that we're told in all the gospel accounts is that when Jesus died on the cross at that moment as he offered himself a sacrifice, it tells us that the temple veil, that big curtain that said you may not draw close, was torn from top to bottom as if God was saying, you now can come. And it's as if we come expecting to be kept at a distance and what we find is that Jesus is sitting in the holy place and he is saying to us every day, every week, every service, every time we come to pray, he is saying, come, come, draw near to God. And that is the amazing invitation that is here. Jesus saying, come and meet my father. I don't know, um, have you seen the film The Last Emperor? Anyone seen the film? Um, it's a, an older film now, but um, I remember watching it, and it's all about the last emperor of China. And the last emperor of China is born in the Forbidden City. And the Forbidden City is, as the name suggests, a place that no one is allowed to go except the emperor and his closest associates and his servants. Everybody else is kept out and the emperor is distant and the emperor doesn't meet the people and the emperor is, is completely uh, isolated from everything that's going on. But the story of the last emperor traces through the story of the Chinese revolution and a whole revolution happens. And at the end of the story, you see something else. You see tourists being shown by guides round the forbidden city. Forbidden no longer. Draw close. Come in. And this is what we are told in this great Christian service and this great Christian message that our revolution has happened and we can enter 
and draw close to God. And amazingly, it says in verse 19, we have confidence to enter. Now, let me just ask a very practical question. Do you always feel confident to come into God's presence? You know, one of the things I, I very often hear from people who have been Christians for a long time is when they're asked if they're a Christian, they reply, I'm trying to be. Have you heard that? Maybe you've said that. And what's really sad about that is not that they're trying to do good things, that, that, that's really good, but that there's that sense of, I've not made it. And it reflects where a lot of Christians are. They're, they're riddled with doubt. Am I good enough? Have I done enough? Does God really care? And you know, the message that we need to hear it and hear again, the old, old story is simply this, that Jesus has done it. So you don't need to feel inadequate. It doesn't matter whether you're just starting off in the Christian life and you, 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 you've come to know Jesus. It doesn't matter whether you've been doing it 100 years. It doesn't matter whether you're the Archbishop of Canterbury or, or you're the worst <laughs> behaved Christian in the world. Maybe those are the same thing, I don't know. It doesn't matter. In fact, I'm just going to ask you just now just to say after me, I am a Christian, if you can do that. Can you do that? I am a Christian. I am accepted by God. I want you to see it because I want you to believe it. I am accepted by God because of what Jesus has done. And that really matters because you can have that confidence. Not because of what you've done. If you think it's about what you've done, you are always going to be one of two things. Either you're going to be the most pompous Pharisee in the world who thinks, I've made it. Obnoxious, terrible Christians, and there are some of those around, by the way. Hope there are none here. Or you're going to be a Christian who's all the time riddled with doubt and guilt, and I, I'm not good enough, and I, I can't be it, and I'm not one of the holy guys in the church, and I, I can't go to the whatever it is. And you don't need to be either of those things because the gospel message tells us you can't do this, but Jesus has done it. So you are accepted to God. You are forgiven because of what Jesus has done. And this is so, so important. We are cleansed, it will say, from a guilty conscience. Therefore, draw near to God with a sincere heart, with full assurance, cleansed from a guilty conscience. There's a story of a little boy who is visiting his grandparents on a farm. And they give him a, a slingshot to play with. And he's told that he can go and play with it in the woods. So he does that and he practices in the woods, but he's not very good at it. And he, he's getting fed up. He can never hit anything when he puts the target up. So he wanders back into the farm lard and there he sees his grandma's pet duck. Just out of impulse, he picks up the thing and flicks. Of course, you know what happens, don't you? Bullseye hits the duck, kills the duck. What does he do? It's his grandma's pet. So he hides it in the woodpile. Maybe she'll not notice. And that day after lunch, grandma says to his sister, Sally, um, it's your turn to wash the dishes. Sally says, uh, Grandma, Johnny told me he wanted to wash the dishes. Didn't you, Johnny? And then she, I suppose in her brother's ear, the duck. So Johnny washes the dishes. And later on, Grandma says to, um, Grandpa says rather to the children, um, I, 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 well, let's go fishing. And Grandma says, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help me make supper. And Sally says, that's all right, Johnny told me he wants to make supper. Remember the duck. And so here's Johnny doing whatever his sister wants, seems to be all the way, and he's pretty miserable about it. And so days go on, and Johnny's doing all Sally's chores, everything she wants. Yes, Sally, no Sally, whatever it is. Eventually, he's had enough of this. 
So he comes to grandma. And he says, grandma, I killed your duck. Grandma kneels down and she gives him a hug and she says, sweetheart, I know. I love you. I forgive you. I was just wondering how long you'd let Sally make a slave of you. You see, this is what happens to us as well. That we become slaves of guilt. We become slaves of inadequacy. We become slaves of sin because we haven't actually grasped that we're forgiven. And that is the liberation that God offers us. Let us draw near to God. And that's not just on a Sunday where we say, don't come and do the rituals of religion because whatever, you enjoy the singing. Come and know the Father. And every time we sit down to pray or we stop in the car just to say, Lord, I need you to be with me in the office this morning. Draw near to God. Because the Father is saying, forget the rest. Know that you're forgiven and I love you. You've failed 50 times, I know. But my son died for you. Draw near to God. Let us draw near to God. And in one sentence, we can skip over the next let us because it, 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 really, it really builds from that. Let us hold to the hope we profess. And that's saying a bit more than, than just let you know that you can come into the presence of God. Know as you do that that his promises to you are true. You don't need to fear death. You don't need to fear the future. Jesus did not say it was going to be easy. Jesus did not say, oh, trust me and everything's fine. Some of us, and I know right now, have gone through awful things. But what he said is, I've got you. I hold you. And your fate, your future is totally, totally secure. The hope that he promises is faithful. And we'll look on more of that as we look at chapters 11 and 12 and those great hymns of faith that come in them in the next few weeks. That's a bit of a trailer for you to come back next week. But let me move on to the third and last lettuce. Let us consider how we might spur one another on to love and good deeds and not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing, but instead encourage each other more and more. If I had a penny for <clears throat> every time I see someone saying, I'm spiritual but not religious. Have you heard folks saying that? I'm spiritual but I'm not religious. And what they mean by that generally is, I'm quite interested in God. I I'm quite interested in prayer. I I'm quite interested in all these things. But in the church, nah. Any form of organized religion, nah. Nah. And in one sense, if you hang around a church for any length of time, you think, gosh, sometimes I can't blame them. <laughs> if you've been some of the churches I've been at, if you've had some of the experiences I've been at at church, and some of us have had very bad experiences, but here's the thing. Ultimately, that comes from our worldview today, which is very individualistic. I can run my life my way, I can do my spirituality my way, and I don't need other people. The Bible has no place for solitary religion or spirituality. If you remember one other thing, remember this. Let us is plural. We do it together. It's the only way it can be. It's the only way it ever could be. Now, this passage, I have to tell you, ministers love it because we get to quote that bit that says, don't give up the habit of meeting together. But, um, and, and then we say to folk, so come to church next week. That's what it's about. And we have a day where people's habit of church going, which I grew up, you went to church in the morning and you went to church in the evening. That's what Sunday was about. Now, even people that are committed Christians, we sometimes find that we're going to church when we can make it. Ministers love this because they get to tell people to come to church services. Actually, that is what it's about, but it's not what it's about. 
Because you can come to a church service and be a bum in a seat. Sorry, I'm not calling you a bum, by the way. But you can. You know, a church service can be a bit like a theater. You go in, you watch the show, you like it, you don't like it, you go out, you think about it, you don't think about it. But that's not let us. That's more individualism. That's just what you get out of it. Or it can be a bit like a club where you come along and you do some stuff together and you hope you make a few friends. But that's actually not what we're talking about here at all. What we're talking about here is much more like a family. It's much more like we're in this together. We're actually here to help each other grow and develop and change. And that's the important bit that is here. To be a Christian, to be a Christian is to be transformed. And the early part of this passage makes it quite clear. It talks about the fact that, that God has forgiven us and made us holy, but then it talks about the fact that we are to be perfected. We are to be changed. In fact, he quotes Isaiah, where Isaiah says, I will make this covenant with them, and that day I will put my law in their hearts. I will write it on their minds. Now, putting God's law on our hearts does not mean we go off and memorize the Ten Commandments. It means something much more than that. It means here is God's intention for Christians. That the very things that His law, His word intended, will be put in your hearts. It's not just about keeping a set of laws. It's about being a completely changed person where you will want to do the things that just give pleasure to God, that change the world around us, that that show that you've changed and been transformed. But you know how God intends us to do that? He intends us to do it together. Now, you might say, gosh, if I wanted to know what perfection looked like, I wouldn't go to church because there's a whole lot of people just like me. But as God transforms us, He wants to transform us not to being individualistic, but to being dependent on other people. As God transforms us, He wants to transform us from being selfish and asking what we get out of things to being people who give into things. He wants to take our bitterness and make us forgiving. And you can only be transformed in those ways together. And that is what the church is all about. We need each other. You know, one of the reasons that we think the Hebrews in this letter had stopped meeting together was was simply this, that it was really hard for them to go to church or gather together. And it was hard because Christians were being publicly persecuted So it was very tempting to say, well, I could just be a Christian on my own, in my own prayer life, my own good living, and and not go to the meetings. And my life would be much, much easier because nobody would know I was a Christian other than I was doing good stuff, and, and that would be fine. No one would be on my case. Now, we fortunately don't get persecuted for coming to a church meeting. But there is a time in life that we actually say, my life would be much easier if I wasn't part of a Christian church. My life would be much easier if I didn't get involved with other people. Because when I get involved with other people, I get hurt. When I get involved with other people, I get let down. When I get involved with other people, we have fights. And it would be much easier if I just trusted myself. But Jesus doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to be a church where we are encouraging each other to grow and change and be transformed. Encourage each other. Spur each other on to love and good deeds. And the word spur can mean provoke. You know? And we need that. We need sometimes in a loving fellowship for folk to say, hang on a minute, that's not on. Or folk to say, you're feeling low? Can I pray for you? Or folk to say, you're going through a hard time, can I sit by you in silence? Or folk to say, if you need help, come and talk to me. Or folk to say, let's work this through together. And that's what we're always supposed to be doing as a church. You can't do this on your own. Parents, you're trying to bring up children, it's hard. How do I do this as a Christian? I'm I'm feeling By the way, talking to the minister might not be the best thing. 
but talking to other parents and encouraging each other and sometimes sharing how you got things wrong because that helps someone else think, I can learn from your mistakes. Folks, some of you are in workplaces. How do I be a Christian if I'm an employer or an employee? Well, there's not much point in talking to the minister. He's not got a real job. But we can share with one another. I have so often been in church and I have been aware that what has touched people is not what I have said from the front. It's afterwards I've looked and seen someone in tears sharing something with someone else in the congregation and I thought that's where God is at work today. Now, I suspect to do that we need to be changing the nature of how we do church together so that it is a place that we can be honest with our questions. It is a place that we can actually talk about our faith and be transformed as Jesus wants us to be transformed. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of going to the Holy Land. Some of you have been. And I had the privilege of going to Jerusalem, and that was fantastic. And I had the privilege of, of going for a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity into the Holy Sepulchre, the place where Jesus rose from the grave. It, it's brilliant. And if you can get an opportunity to go, take it. But it was very special for me. But when I was there, I met a guy called David. Well, his name was pronounced differently because he was Arab, but David will do because it's easier to pronounce than, than how he pronounced it. Uh, David lived in Jerusalem. Think about that. This was a special place for me. He walked about the streets in Jerusalem just like you might walk down the street in Motherwell or Wishaw. This holy city, that's where he was every day. And not only that, but his dad was a deacon in the local church. Big deal. Yeah, the local church was the holy sepulcher. So when he went to worship on a Sunday, he was going into the place where Jesus had physically risen from the dead. And that just blew my mind. Imagine doing that. And then I suddenly thought, we take for granted ourselves this invitation to draw close to the holy God. We take for granted this day-by-day -day opportunity to come and be part of God's people, part of the people that he's using in all the brokenness to transform the world. Sometimes we need to stand back and say, what a privilege. Wow. Let us draw near to God. Let us do it with confidence. Let us do it in hope. Let us do it together. Amen. We're going to sing together the hymn, Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness.
Let's pray together. We draw near to you, Lord, and we do that thanking you for the privilege and confessing that we often take it for granted. And we would pray, Lord, not just that we do it in this service, but this week, that you would draw us close to you and fill us with delight in you, knowing that we are forgiven and you just delight to spend time with us. We pray, Lord, that we would be enabled to encourage each other more and more. For we thank you for the privilege of bringing us into a family. We confess that we often take that family for granted. We often look at it through our own eyes with what we get out or, or what we are hurt by. But we pray that together we would encourage each other to love and good deeds, that you would Teach us to be forgiving, for we need to be forgiven. To be encouraging, because we need encouragement. Never to give up on each other, for you never give up on us. To pray and to bless O oh Lord, by your Holy Spirit, unite us as, as a congregation. We seek to move forward. Lead us by your Spirit. Not the buildings might be good or structures or any of those things, but that your presence might be among us. Help us to put before you the things that we treasure about the way that we do church, to lay them before you as things that are not important but to desire nothing more than the building of each other up, the building up of your church in Motherwell as we seek a presbytery plan together. O oh Lord, enable us to rejoice when other members of this body rejoice and to grieve when other members of this body grieve. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to close by singing all my days, all my days, not just Sunday, I will sing this, joy, this song of worship.
And now go from here and in the peace of the Lord serve Him and in confidence of His love know Him as we go together in Him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forever. Amen.